Hey everyone, welcome back to Wrath of Math. In today's video, we'll be explaining summation notation, often also called sigma notation. This is a great way to write out long sums that follow a specific pattern in a very clear and concise way. So let me write a sum here using summation notation, and then we'll talk a little bit about what all of this means. So this big character here that kind of looks like an E is a capital sigma. It's a Greek character, and it's what we use for summation notation. This I down here is what's called the index, or the index of summation. This is a part of the sum that changes as we continue to add things together. This I equals zero down here tells us the starting value for the index, so we'll call it the starting point. So I starts at zero. Then, this 4 above the sigma tells us the final value for the index, so this is the stopping point. When we have a sum written like this, the index only takes on integer values. Remember that integers are numbers like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on. So, since i starts at 0, and stops at 4, that means that i will take on values of 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. This expression here, the 2i, is the thing that we'll be adding, so we call it the summand. So all this summation notation tells us to do is to add this expression here to itself over and over again for every possible value of i. And this starting point and this stopping point tells us what those values of i should be. So let's write this out to try to clarify exactly what is meant by this sum. Remember, we start at i equals zero, so the first term of our sum is two times i, where i is zero, that's two times zero. Then we just have to increment i up by one, and add again, two times i, i is one, so we have two times one. Then increment i up again, so we have two times two. Increment i up again, we have 2 times 3, and then increment i up again, we have 2 times 4, and this is where we stop because 4 is the stopping point, and this happens to be equal to 20. So all we did was add the sum and over and over again, starting at the starting point, i equals 0, and then in each term we increment i up by 1, so we went from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and we stop at the stopping point, which was i equals 4. It's pretty nifty if I do say so myself. Here's another way we'll sometimes see long sums that follow a pattern written out. It has an ellipsis here in the middle to indicate that the pattern established in the first few terms continues all the way through the last few terms. There are a few drawbacks to this method. The two most obvious ones are that one, it takes up a lot of space. The second one being that it's just sometimes an ambiguous notation. Sometimes the pattern established isn't that clear. But with summation notation, we completely avoid ambiguity, because the pattern is very explicitly laid out for us right here. It tells us the general form of every term in the sum. So let's try writing this sum out using summation notation. We start off, of course, with our sigma. We can see that the general form of the terms in this sum is 3 times something to some power. So the important question here is what is our index variable? We have a variable in the sum, which is x, but what's important to note is that this is not the index variable, because x is not the value that's getting incremented up throughout the sum. x isn't changing throughout this whole sum, but its exponent is. So 3 is always being multiplied by x, and x is being raised to a different power each time. So our index variable is going to be the exponent of x. And we'll use an n this time, just so you know you don't always have to use the same variable. So what are our starting and stopping points for the index n? Well, the first term is 3 times x to the power of 1. So we're going to start at n equals 1. And then it goes on and on and on, and finally stops at 8. So n is going to go from 1 to 8. And this is it. This is the sum of 3 times x to the power of n from n equals 1 to n equals 8. And it's equal to this. And I don't know about you, but I think this is a much nicer way of writing it out. And don't get me wrong, there are some instances where you might want to write it out this way, but this is also a very nice way to write it. 
One other thing I want to mention is that the stuff we're adding doesn't always have to change. So for example, we could have our index start at 1, and let's say it goes all the way to 5, but the index doesn't necessarily need to be in our sumand. So in this case, we still have to keep track of our index if we want to write this sum out, but the index isn't directly involved in the sumand. So this is going to be equal to 4 for i equals 1, and then for i equals 2, it's still just equal to 4, so we add 4 again. And then we increment i up to i equals 3, we add 4 again. i equals 4, we add 4 again. And i equals 5, we add 4 again. And that's where we stop, because i equals 5 is the stopping point. You see, because our index wasn't in the sumand, the sumand never changed. We had to add 4 for i equals 1, we had to add 4 for i equals 2, we had to add 4 for i equals 3, we had to add 4 for i equals 4, and we had to add 4 for i equals 5. So it works the same as the previous examples, it starts at the starting point and ends at the stopping point, the index just isn't directly involved in our sumand. Adding 4 to itself 5 times, that's the definition of 5 times 4, which is equal to 20. There are times where you'd rather write multiplication as addition, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to mention this. I also think it's important to know that the index doesn't always have to be in our sumand. So that's how summation notation works. You can certainly find some more complicated examples that use some slightly different notation, but they're mostly easy to understand once you understand all of this. So a quick recap, this summation symbol is a capital sigma. Below the sigma, we see our index of summation. If the index is in our sumand, then it's going to take on different values throughout the sum. Of course, below the sigma, we also see the starting point for our index. And above the sigma, we see our stopping point. So all this notation means is to add the sumand up over and over again, starting at the starting point and stopping at the stopping point and incrementing the index variable up 1 at each step. And keep in mind that the sumand can be anything. It doesn't have to be some simple multiplication like what we did here. So be prepared to potentially see some pretty nasty sumands. I hope this video helped you understand summation notation, how to use it, and how to read it. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. If you would like, I could certainly go over some more examples of summation notation in another video. Thank you very much for watching, I'll see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math videos on the internet. And a big thanks to Valo, who, upon my request, kindly gave me permission to use his music in my math lessons. Link to his music in the description. You always ask how I am. What's it look like to you?